Um, Suzanne is currently the Integrity Commissioner and Lobbyist Registra Registrar at the City of Vaughan, um, and she also uh, fulfills similar roles, uh, Integrity Commissioner, Accountability Officer, Closed Meeting Investigator at numerous other local governments uh, in and around sort of the GTA area. Uh, a lawyer by training, uh, Suzanne spent many years in various leadership roles uh, with the provincial government uh, before taking on a position as director of uh, corporate access and privacy for the city of Toronto. Um, she's here to talk to us today about topics ranging, I think, from leadership, ethics, and accountability at the, at the local level, uh, as well as uh, some of the recent changes made to the municipal accountability regime in Ontario. So please join me in welcoming Suzanne Craig. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm looking around at a vast gamut of faces and um, I'm sure that you're all here for various reasons, but I have a passion for local government. Uh, years and years ago, uh, years and years ago, I went to, to law school and I, I said I wanted to change the world. Uh, and then I realized that there was this machine that was, was local government or provincial government or federal government, wherever I was, that stymied anything I wanted to do. So I realized what, uh, no, no offense, no offense. It, it, was, it was not the actual people working, but it was this mammoth thing called local government. And so I thought, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to find out how we can get things moving and, and get those laws in place from the ground up so the people that they were made for could actually be helped by these laws. So as Joe said, I'm the integrity commissioner for several municipalities. At one point, I think it was around 20, and that was only because I was the first out of, uh, out of the, uh, the gate. There was David Mullen, who's an esteemed law professor. He was the first integrity commissioner in Ontario. And after he laid the groundwork for all of us, we had uh, Val Je um, uh, Janet Leaker, who was the integrity commissioner of the city of Toronto, and myself. And so at that time, people were trying to figure out what exactly is accountability, what are uh, integrity commissioners, and so uh, a lot of people engaged me just because they didn't know what an integrity commissioner was. They later found out that you probably don't want someone like me as your integrity commissioner because um, I've been called uh, a privacy czar. I've been called an integrity czar. I don't, I don't really like my name associated with czar, but I'll take it for now because it's much better than what uh, one newspaper called me. They called me the Maytag repair woman because apparently what I do is I sit around and do nothing because I'm toothless and I have no ability to make a difference. But that's okay, I don't take things personally because I know that we're all here uh, because we believe in government, we believe in the democratic process, and we believe that as professionals in whatever area of government you are in, that you can make a difference. So um, before I get started on my slides, I'm just going to uh, Play this YouTube video for you. I hope that it. Um, let's see. You use the actual mouse for that. Oh, I do. Okay. okay. All right. So let's see if we can just get in the mood here for what uh, accountability is all about. <laughs> I don't think the vestiture is too high a price to pay to be the president of the United States of America. Stepping back from running his positions is meaningless from a conflicts of interest pr perspective. The presidency is a full-time job and he would have had to step back anyway. The many, many companies that are being put into trust to be run by my two sons. And I hope at the end of eight years, I'll come back and I'll say, oh, you did a good job. Otherwise, if they do a bad job, I'll say, you're fired.
take it off? Oh, you might want to, if it keeps playing, I don't know. We'll just close it down. So uh, the ethics, uh, the eth ethics commissioner was uh, fired, um, and that's what happens sometimes when you decide to uh, tell an elected official, whether they be south of the border, in another country, or in our back uh, in our backyard, that there are rules that an elected official must abide by in order to fully represent the public. This slide here, I just wanted to uh, to touch uh, on very briefly. It's uh, from New Zealand State Services Commission, and it, it, it covers what happens to me when I talk to elected officials, because I've got to say, with all the elected officials that I've encountered, mayors, um, uh, elected officials at the provincial and federal level, I've never had someone come to my face and say, you know what, I want to make sure that my position is used to curry favor for my family and my neighbors and my business partners, and I want to make sure that I can make some money and then when I leave this office, I want to make sure that I can get jobs for my friends. Never met someone who's ever said that to me. They've always said, I'm here to help people. I'm here to have bike lanes. I'm here to develop the waterfront. I want to make sure that they're daycare centers. I want to make sure that taxes don't go up. So this quote here is very interesting because it says, public service integrity always revolves around managing conflicts of interest. Local government problems with ethics are always about conflicts of interest. It entails balancing personal interests and obligations of service to the community. Where you stand directly influences what you see. So people come into elected office and they say, this is what I want to do. And then they become politicians and somehow that focus changes. Not infrequently, we do not see impropriety in our own actions and cannot understand why others see a personal interest. So what are we going to cover today? I'd like to just go over very briefly the, the arc of what brought accountability officers to local government from Bill 130 to Bill 68, which has just recently come into force, and some of its accountability provisions are going to come into force in March of 2019. I want to talk very briefly about a code of conduct. What is it? Why do we have it? And how does it work? I want to talk briefly about compliance. How does this code of conduct, this standard for elected officials, translate into rules followed by elected officials? And finally, because of all of you and what you're doing and where you are in your careers, where do we go from here? So hopefully I'll be able to do this quickly and we'll have some time at the end to have questions or if there are no questions, we can just get out of here sooner. So in 2006, over 10 years ago, the province amended the Municipal Act. I'm sure you're all aware that the Municipal Act is that body of legislation that gives municipalities their powers, their authorities. They can't act without a provision saying that they can. When this bill came into force, the former Ombudsman, I'm sure all of you remember him, Monsieur uh, Andre Morin, the former Ombudsman said about this uh, piece of legislation, and I quote, because I can't speak like him, so I'm gonna quote what he said. The general problem with Bill 130's ombudsman, ombudsman provisions is that they provide legislative authority to create toothless oversight. Unless amendments are made to this legislation, he said, there will be municipalities who take up the invitation to use the goodwill of the name of ombudsman, which he coined, to create and operate what will be enfeebled and ineffective offices. So, Many of us who were toothless oversight officers uh, took some exception to that, but I can say that the cornerstone of an effective municipal accountability officer is independence. You must be independent, impartiality, you must maintain confidentiality, and you must have a credible investigative process, which affords whoever you're investigating with due process. There are 444 municipalities in, in uh, Ontario, and as of uh, the passing of Bill 130, prior to Bill 68 coming into force, about 40 of them voluntarily decided to have an accountability officer in the integrity commissioner role. So there wasn't great uptake in deciding to have accountability at the local level. So what happened? What prompted local municipalities to say, you know what province, we'd like to have accountability officers, we'd like them to kind of look like the province, kind of like the feds. What happened at the municipal level? 
In Montreal, we know that uh, Justice Chabonneau investigated uh, the city of Montreal and she deemed that organized crime had infiltrated into the tendering process. Deloitte Canada investigated the city of Brampton and found that people were charging $220 to play games on their phone to their corporate account and they were purchasing up to $128,000 worth of plane tickets for business. So what are we looking at? We've got elected officials who say, I want to help underprivileged youth. I want to develop our waterfront. I want to make sure that people are investing. I'm the mayor, and I think we're going to have a great development here, and my son has a company that can really help us out. So what happens if you are the mayor, and you want the best for your city, and your son just happens to have a company that is courting various interests to come to that city? Do you say it doesn't matter because we want the best for the city, or do you say there could be a conflict here? Justice Cunningham <coughs> answered that by letting us know that there was a conflict, although the esteemed mayor at the time felt that there was no conflict. In 2014, there had been several successful integrity commissioners who were voluntarily appointed by municipalities. However, as I said, of the 444 municipalities, very few had voluntarily appointed an integrity commissioner. So what happened? The province of Ontario said, no action is happening here. We gave you a piece of legislation, your, your own level of government. We said, go ahead and do your own oversight. And only about 10% of you have done that. So what the province said is there's no action here. So we're going to create another piece of legislation and we're going to give the ombudsman oversight over your oversight municipalities. So this particular piece of legislation uh, enabled the Ombudsman of Ontario to be able to investigate integrity commissioners, ombudsmen, lobbyist registrars, and the municipality in general. Of the many provisions brought in by Bill 8, one of the major uh, significant provisions was jurisdiction over integrity commissioners. So we as integrity commissioners asked ourselves, what would happen if there was a complaint against one of us? Or what would happen if there was a complaint against the municipality? Would the ombudsman of the day, who was Mr. Moran, would the ombudsman of the day request our files? Would we have to waive the confidentiality that we were required to maintain? Or if there was no integrity commissioner and there was no code of conduct, we asked ourselves, would Mr. Moran invent the model code against which he would investigate uh, uh, the wrongdoing alleged? So we weren't quite sure what his jurisdiction looked like. It wasn't clear. And we also realized that there were so many different standards at the municipal level. Some people had uh, integrity commissioners who had to go first to council to say, I've got a complaint. It's against him. Can I investigate? Others had independent integrity commissioners who could operate at arm's length from council. So shortly after Mr. Dubé left office, Ms. Uh, Mr. Uh, Moran left office, Mr. Dubé uh, was appointed and he came to one of our meetings and he explained what his jurisdiction would look like. He said, look, I have oversight over integrity commissioners and municipalities and over councils, but what I'm going to do is ask you to develop your local accountability regimes because I don't want to come in and tell you what to do. I'm encouraging you to develop your own accountability regimes. And I can say thus far, there's, there's a relatively good relationship with the Ombudsman's Office that was absent in the past. Now, why do I have this slide here? I think a lot of us who work in government, and many of you who will be working in government, there's this, there's this concern that when an oversight body brings to the fore something that we might have done wrong, it's a problem. And I always felt from the days back in the city of Toronto, that the best way to deal with the problem is get it out there first. And uh, this particular example of the Ombudsman of Ontario's draft report uh, was one of those examples where something, uh, something that looked like a, a criticism actually turned out to be a great way to build accountability. Uh, the, the Ombudsman of Ontario used to have great titles. So his title of this particular report was Pirating Our Property. Uh, it was one of the nicer uh, titles that he had. Um, but in, in, in this particular report, he said that the municipality, when given a draft report to comment on, didn't give it back. And that was true. We, the municipality didn't give it back. But what happened is that municipalities learned that when you get a draft report from the uh, Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario or from the Ombudsman <coughs> of Ontario, you, municipality, are being investigated 
you have an opportunity to say, yeah, that doesn't look too good. We have to do a better job. Here's why these problems arose, and here's how we'd like to work together with you to fix it. So I think from my perspective, when I was working at the City of Toronto, there was an FOI request almost days after I became uh, the Executive Director of Access and Privacy. And I had the Star and the Globe and a couple of other media outlets banging on my door saying, why are you not releasing this information? Because the previous uh, director had applied every exemption under the legislation to not disclose the information. So what I did was I looked at the draft report of the Information and Privacy Commissioner and I said, you're absolutely right. You know, that information should go out. But here's the problem. We have microfiche. We have records that are in basements in Downsview. So we need to work together to find a way to get this information. And so the Information and Privacy Commissioner worked with the City of Toronto to develop a routine disclosure policy. So I guess the reason I brought forward this, this slide was just to say that when you're working in government, oftentimes when the finger is pointed and someone says to you, you're not doing it fast enough, you're not doing it right, and the public is clamoring and saying, we want that information, sometimes the best answer is, you're absolutely right. And sometimes the best tact is to say, oversight body, we don't have the staff, we don't have the resources, and you've got the experience. Can you partner with us so we can work together so that we can be in compliance with the legislation? So it's, it's one way that a bad news story can be turned into a good news story. Bill 68 is that piece of legislation that accountability officers have been looking for for quite some time. With this piece of legislation, all 444 municipalities in Ontario must have a code of conduct by March 2019. They must have an integrity commissioner. They must have minimum standards in their code of conduct, and they have to establish a protocol between members of council and staff, because we all know anyone who's worked in uh, municipal government or in provincial government, that there is sometimes an uncomfortable relationship between members of council and members of staff, because members of council or provincial uh, ministers' offices feel that they can come in and take whatever information they need because they're speaking on behalf of the public, and they are speaking on behalf of the public, but they are only one member of a body that acts in concert and so the administrative staff has the opportunity to take direction from the elected officials, but the elected officials don't get to tell staff what to do. So this is a great and welcomed piece of, uh, piece of legislation. It's coming into force in March 2019 as it relates to integrity commissioners and the roles of integrity commissioners. And I think one of the really interesting um, add-ons that uh, integrity commissioners will have is the ability to investigate municipal conflict of interest Act complaints. Now, if you recall a couple of years ago with the, uh, the former and deceased Mayor Ford, uh, there was a very controversial case because Mr. Ford was investigated by the then Integrity Commissioner of the City of Toronto, and she found that he had breached the code. And then when Mr. Ford decided that he was not going to reimburse the people who had given him money according to the uh, decision of the Integrity Commissioner, um, it was found that he had a conflict of interest and a member of the public brought this before the court. And Justice Hacklin, the judge who, uh, who over, oversaw that particular case, had no choice. Under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, if a member of council has breached that piece of legislation, out they go. And so if you recall, Mr. Ford's seat was uh, declared vacant, but he was given the amount of time to appeal that decision and it turned out well for him. But what that underscored is that piece of legislation, which I refer to as the MCIA, Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, is, as he stated, draconian. It's from the dark ages, because if you, if you don't pay back $700, which is still money, uh, and under, uh, under the, uh, the uh, MCIA, it's, it's, it's reason to, to uh, rule that you breach the act, you lose your office. So the electorate who voted for an individual will be overruled by, by a judge which is doable, but is it always the best way to go? So one of the things that an integrity commissioner in Ontario will be able to do at the municipal level, starting in March 2019, is receive those complaints under the NCIA embedded into the code of conduct and investigate. So the integrity commissioner could say, yep, you breached it, but it was inadvertent or it was in good faith, and so I'm going to 
dock your pay for 30 days as opposed to vacating your seat. Or conversely, the integrity commissioner could say, I think this is serious, so I'm going to start a court action, and um, maybe a judge will decide you should be docked 90 days, or you should have a reprimand from counsel, or the court can say, out you go, we're declaring your seat vacant. So this particular piece of legislation is changing the landscape of accountability, but it's also making things a little bit more flexible for integrity commissioners and for the courts. So what is a, what is a code of conduct and what are we to expect with the provisions in a code of conduct? <clears throat> Every time there's a new election, and we've got an election on October the 22nd, I have a new or sometimes familiar faces of elected officials, and they're all raring to go and you know, this person was uh, was was, uh, was campaigning on we're going to have no more plastic bags, and this person was campaigning on uh, we're going to have light rail, and this person was campaigning on uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna make sure that uh, mental health is is a priority in in our in our community, and then they come to this organization which has a city manager, a CAO a city solicitor, it's got staff, people, people work in public works, people work in economic uh, development. And these individuals who worked hard to become elected and who have beliefs and perspectives have to sit around a table and get along. And they have to sit around a table and get along and think with one mind. So what I usually say to members of council as they come for their first overview session as newly elected members of council, um, the code of conduct represents your agreement to adhere to these standards because you're all going to work together. It's your charter. And so none of you have a status in law. And, and I don't know if I'm comfortable with that, but I know that the members of council that I have worked with are definitely not comfortable with that. Because if you know and look at the Municipal Act, there's a section that talks about the role of council. There's a section that talks about the role of the city manager, the city solicitor, the planner. There's a there's a section and sections that talk about employees and staff. But you go through the hundreds of pages of the Municipal Act and what you won't see is one provision that says, and the role of the individual member of council is this. And that's because in law, our province has said and continues to say, even with the current amendments, there is no role for an individual member of council. And that's why we have codes of conduct, because an individual member of council has no authority in law or otherwise to act independently. They can't direct staff, they can't make decisions, they can't access information that is confidential, they can't sign contracts, they have to work in concert, and whenever they try to do that, they would be breaching one of their code responsibilities. And so I often say that the role of council is to work together, but the role of council is also to understand that a member of council has no independent role. So what is what is it that an elected member of council is supposed to do? Um, this is when I usually turn to people and say, I don't need to know exactly where you live, I certainly don't want to know who you voted for, but are you happy with your municipal council? Nodding in agreement, yes. No? Does anyone care? See, this is important. Now, I understand that, that provincially we had a great voter turnout. We have had, and I know that our, our municipal folks here can attest to this, pretty abysmal voter turnout at the municipal level. So what happens if you are a shareholder and your board is not doing what they're supposed to do? What remedy do you have as a shareholder? Anyone? I can tell you that I'd vote them out at the next annual general meeting. But the only way that you can vote out or show support for your board members is if you get out there. So one of the things that I say to people when they say, we need more teeth in our codes of conduct and we need to make sure that members of council do what they're supposed to do, I say, you're absolutely right. And guess who has that responsibility? You do. And so what is the role of a council member? To set policy, big P policy. What is the other role? To carry out a fiduciary duty. Not to tell the treasurer how to do her job, but to set the plan and the budget for four years. What are they also supposed to do? They are ward representatives. So they can go into their community, they can listen to their community, and then they can come to the council table where they have not one voice, but a collective voice, and they can bring those 
issues to council for debate. So council is supposed to work together with the administration, with head of council, with the officers and the employees of the, of the corporation, and they have to make sure that the standards of the code are upheld. And this is a lot of information for, for one member of council to, to understand and, and, and to work through. So what I always do is I point to section 224 of the Municipal Act and say, this is what council does as a collective body. And I point to the section of, of the Municipal Act that talks about the statutory role of a head of council and the statutory role of staff. And then I say, many members of council come with different perspectives and that's what makes municipal local government rich because people come with their different perspectives. However, once they become elected, they're held to a higher standard. They're no longer the guy who is knocking on the door doing whatever they want to do. And many people have said to me, well, but I've known this guy all my life. And the fact that he's a developer shouldn't, you know, stop me from, you know, talking to him and going to his house and going to his fundraising events. And that's what members of council have to realize. And that's been one of the most difficult uh, pieces of information that I've had to share with members of council because you still get to keep your friendships, but you can't wear two hats. And what we say in, in law is that you cannot have two masters. Old English term, can't wear two hats. You're either a private citizen or you're an elected official. And once you become an elected official, you have to abide by the rules of that council that has elected you. So the purpose of the standards of the code in many respects is to trace those lines of the different pieces of legislation and say, you don't actually have a role in any of these pieces of legislation, but there's this circle that touches all of these laws that govern municipal government. And we're gonna say that you're gonna abide by all those rules. You're gonna respect staff and you're gonna make sure that you never use your knowledge of friends or family to curry favor for them or for yourself. So when we're talking about counselor bias, um, there are a couple of cases at uh, the Supreme Court that talk about a reasonable apprehension of bias. And it says that members of council have to understand that in the exercise of their public duty, if a reasonably informed person thinks that what they're doing is biased or currying favor for someone else, then it is. It's not just what they think, but it's what their constituents think. It's what other people think that they're their, their actions would be doing in favor of someone else. But how does this translate in, in bringing forward a court uh, challenge? We have a, a, a decision in 1990, and it still stands, where a member of council was challenged and said, we think that you're, you, you're biased. We actually think that you, you've made your decision ahead of time. You don't want that bill to pass. You're sitting there in your council seat, and you've already made up your mind. And so what he did was he and his lawyers got together and they wrote an affidavit and he said, my mind is open. I'm still listening to everything that everyone is saying. And the Supreme Court said, you know what? Absolutely right. So while we hold members of council to a high standard of not, um, not uh, acting in such a way that can be perceived that they are currying favor with a family member or a friend or a business associate, we also say, but as long as you're willing to, to, to sign an affidavit saying that your, your mind is still open, then it's still open. So we get back to doing the right thing. And, and when we are developing codes of conduct, uh, the important thing for me is not to say, here's what the legislation says, not to say, here's what your code of conduct says, but, but to get to the person, to say to the individual member of council, you know what? This code compliance is about your relationship with your public and your legacy that you will leave. This is a member, a former member of Vaughan City Council. Um, what happened was there, there was a, a code complaint against this member. Uh, the member was alleged to have uh, lobbied strongly in favor of a company that he knew to make sure that they could win some pretty big tenders. And the allegation in the complaint was he was pretty forceful in trying to get staff to do what he wanted. And uh, after investigating several individuals, I found that the member of council had used his influence of office to try to ensure that the procurement bylaw was stymied and that the contract was awarded to individuals who he knew. 
So what I say to members of council is here's some proactive ways that you can avoid a conflict of interest. Know that when you have a matter that's going before council, ask your family. You know what, we're, we're gonna be uh, approving this development. Have you bought into um, condos in that area? Do you live around there? Uh, do you work for the law firm that is handling the developer? Um, I also say carefully review your meeting agenda. Know what council is going to be talking about so you can see if you have a conflict of interest. Seek independent legal advice. What I say to members of council that they shouldn't do is walk down to the procurement department, knock on the window, say, hey, <coughs> let me see those documents and give that contract to my boys. Because when that happens, you've reached every rule in the, in the book. And you know, I say that and people go, well, that, that probably doesn't happen, but, but it does. Because when you have a member of council who has a stature in the community, it's usually somebody who's been around for quite some time, and you are a staff person, how comfortable do you feel when that member of council says, I need that document? How comfortable do you feel following that staff council protocol that says, if you feel in any way intimidated or harassed by a member of council, bring it to the integrity commissioner. And she will begin a process where she will give your complaint to that person who's harassing you. And afterwards, the most that person will get is a 90 day <laughs> suspension of pay. How comfortable do you feel doing that? So there has to be a groundswell of change in the organization for individual staff people to feel they so feel that this is important, that they're willing to put their jobs on the line. The individual who filed this complaint in the city of Vaughan um, was courageous. The individual trusted the process and it was a difficult process, but the process succeeded because the member was, was chastised by his own peer. And the city of Vaughan identified that this is not the type of behavior that they want to sign on to. So ethics is doing the right thing and being held to a higher standard. Ethics is a set of moral principles and values and their duties and obligations that an elected official signs on to when they say, vote for me. So on the left, we have uh, someone that you all recognize, an esteemed journalist uh, who became a politician, became a senator. And we can talk about all the years of service and all the years of professional activity of Mr. Duffy, or we can remember that one year of trial that he went through. Now, the good news for him is there were 31 counts of not guilty. So at the end of the day, he can say he was vindicated. But what exactly do we remember? What is the lasting effect of, of any sort of breach or allegation of a breach? Do we remember the articles and the stories and the esteem with which he was held? Or do we remember him walking past the reporters every single day? And so what I say to elected officials is, it's not good enough to say, but you know what, the rules said I could do that. Because the rules did say he could do that. It's important to say, am I doing the right thing? Because when you sign on as an elected official for all of us, you are saying, I'm standing in your stead. You know what, Suzanne? You can't go to all those meetings, but I'm gonna go on your behalf. You know what, Suzanne? You can't say we're gonna build that library, but we're not gonna build that daycare center, but I'm gonna go in your stead. So if I gave somebody $100 and said, go spend it for me, and you spent it the wrong way and said, but nobody said I couldn't, that's not <clears throat> ethical. So what I say to elected officials is it's not about the rules that are on the books, it's doing the right thing. And that's a hard thing to teach. And that's why in local government, you have to have patience, you have to have perseverance, and you have to be willing to speak up and say to elected officials, I'm here for you. I'm the professional who is the scientist or the lawyer or the public policy uh, individual. I am the accountant, I am the treasurer, I am the healthcare worker, and I have subject matter expertise that, that can assist you in doing your work. I can tell you that of the uh, of the 20 or so municipalities for which I work, people would say, why do we need a code of conduct anyway? Because you know what? If I'm doing the right thing, I'm doing the right thing. And if he's not doing the right thing, he's gonna just continue doing the right thing. And my answer was always twofold. You don't wanna bring yourself down to the lowest common denominator. But I also said that with a code of conduct, and now it is mandatory, 
you can only lose 90 uh, days of your case. So for some people, that's not a big deal. For some people, that, that could amount to a significant amount of money. But a public report of the integrity commissioner is something that is lasting and it is detrimental to one's reputation. And if somebody wants to continue in politics, that's not what they want. And so that's why people say to me, you know, uh, Suzanne, your reports are really long. You know, I mean, it takes forever to read your reports. And the reason I write long reports is because A, I believe that if I'm gonna say to someone, you're unethical, I better have the proof to back it up. Secondly, I wanna make sure that that person who I've investigated knows that that report is going to be on every news feed. It's going to be in every library of public policy. It's going to be in the hands of every student who is studying public policy, all 31 pages with appendices. So if you're going to take this lightly, you're going to use people's money and you're going to say, you know, who really cares? You know, if you have no oversight ability, you're right. All I can do is recommend 90 day suspension of pay. But I've got a 30 page report and I'm going to sit in front of council and I'm going to go through every page of your wrongdoing. Let me see how often you're going to breach your rules the next time around. Funny thing is, they keep hiring me. Don't know why, but I think, but I think it's because at the end of the day, most of the elected officials out there want to do the right thing. So when one of their peer is the squeaky wheel, they're not okay with it. It's like a bully. Do we know any bullies in politics anywhere who just stomp really hard and figure if they continue to do that, no one's going to come against them? I'm telling you right now that most of the people who run for office want to do the right thing, but they have to be emboldened. They have to be emboldened with statutes. They have to be emboldened with people who are willing to back up those rules. And, uh, and we are those people. So we're looking at this particular, um, uh, I'll, I'll send you the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, but this particular individual um, had, a, had a liaison. You know, I mean, happens, you work, you have a liaison. But the thing is, notwithstanding the municipality saying, you know what, these, these types of relationships are not okay, and notwithstanding the accountability uh, officer saying, you've breached the code, the person stayed. So one of the issues that we have to deal with is that we have the courts that say, if there's a conflict of interest, the courts can say, we're vacating your seat. You're no longer a member of council, and actually you cannot run for office for another seven years. As, a, as an integrity commissioner, I can't unseat a member of council. And I wouldn't want to, but one of the things that we have to remember as you're working with people is that sometimes that apple stay. Sometimes bad apples decide they're going to come back and they're going to run for office. And so the code is only as effective as the members of council who sign on to that. <laughs> so what happens when an elected individual makes poor choices? <clears throat> ICs work to have elected officials understand that the code belongs to them. They represent all of the municipality, not just the individuals who voted for them. In my education, the greatest way to ensure compliance with ethical rules is education. Education, education, education. Giving out handouts having PowerPoint presentations, meeting one-on-one -on -one with elected officials, putting information up on your websites, having symposium, having training of your staff so that they can look at the newest uh, privacy uh, policies, they can look at the newest local governance policies so they can bring that to the elected officials. Sometimes elected officials need to hear it many times before it sinks in because even the most recalcitrant contravener of a code sometimes just needs to hear it one more time with feeling. But at the end of the day, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, <coughs> are our ethical documents representing values and standards of the individuals who voted for an elected official? Because if the code itself is out of sync with the individuals who are elected and the individuals get reelected, the question then becomes, 
what are the values of our elected officials? Because the code belongs to them. I'm gonna end by saying that doing the right thing is never easy and it's a moving target. And in my experience, the important part of doing the right thing is in your local area, building confidential confidentiality and privacy rights into the infrastructure of your governance models. It's working to change the pieces of legislation that govern elected officials, like the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act and the Municipal Election Act, which has been done. It is strengthening your accountability officers to ensure that they get a place at the table, that when you are training new elected officials, that you don't train them on the procedural bylaw and train them on how they get expenses and train them on how they buy magazines for their office. And way down the line, you train them on access, privacy, and accountability. Make access, privacy, accountability, and integrity an important part of the first principle of your elected official. No one pretends that democracy is perfect. And as we all know, Churchill said, the worst form of government is democracy, except for all the others that have been tried from time to time. I like what Will Rogers said. He said, I can't do the accent, but he said, on account of being a democracy and run by the people, we're the only nation in the world that has to keep a government for four years, no matter what it does. I'm an accountability officer and I enjoy what I do. I find it challenging. I find it frustrating. I went before the, uh, the committee uh, that was, was looking for input on the changes to the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act and the Municipal Act. And I said very clearly that uh, it's a difficult task but it's one worth doing. I look at you and I look at your cohort and some of you who graduated, some of you who are working in the industry and some of you who will be working in the industry. And I say, don't be afraid to tear down some of the rules. Don't be afraid to challenge what is there, but don't be afraid to look at what was done before. Because sometimes some of those old policies, if you dust them off, you can find some good bones. But whatever happens, remember that elected officials are representatives of the public Professionals are independent from elected officials and codes of conduct are now given more strength. We've been given with Bill 68 an opportunity to investigate and to bring a matter to court, which ultimately could unseat a member of council. So I encourage you to continue to, uh, I would say, fight the good fight. Uh, we're all in this together and ensure that you don't lose sight of the fact that from Bill 130 to Bill 68, we've had progress. We've had accountability officers who've been strengthened in their roles, and we've had a couple of elected officials who are no more. And they've learned that these rules do work. They're slow, but they're not toothless. So I encourage you to continue what you do. That's my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. really interesting. Um, you know, when I look at the literature on this kind of thing, it seems like there's, there's two strands, right? There are people who focus on institutions, on, on accountability regimes, and creating officers, and creating rules, codes, and legislation, and so on. Um, the logic being that external enforcement is going to make organizations and people who work within them more ethical. On the other side, we have uh, an argument that you know institutions can't make bad people good, but we need to put all our emphasis on this culture, organizational culture, and, and creating <coughs> workplace cultures that, that reward ethical behavior. Uh, and you know these are sort of presented almost as uh, being on separate tracks. What I think I heard from you is that that's probably the false dichotomy um, that these things are actually mutually reinforcing. We need to think about the rules creating. Can you, can you sort of comment on, on that way of thinking? I'll, I'll try. I, I think that um, that I agree with the statement that um, no matter how strong your regime, you're not going to make a bad person a good person. But what I will say by way of an example is that sometimes when you have all of those pieces in place, those really strong rules, you have the offices of oversight, you have the leaders both at the administrative level and the elected level that say, we're going to work together. When it all comes together, then even if you have someone who's not signed on, who is, quote unquote, not following the rules, it works. Because though you can't change that person, you can make sure that they're not 
welcome at the table. An example I'll give you is the city of Vaughan. Uh, it was about a year ago. There was a complaint of sexual harassment by a member of council. And of course, the individual staff person was living uh, a, a, a horrendous experience of being um, harassed by her employer who was a member of council. So this individual did not follow the rules, saw nothing wrong with what he was doing. As you saw in the first slide, the perception was, I'm not doing anything wrong. But we had in place the whistleblower uh, hotline. We had the Office of the Integrity Commissioner. We had a mayor who stood for the rules and ensured that the independent officer was given full breadth of her uh, accountability authority. And we had a city manager and city solicitor who, who took no prisoners. They stood for staff and said, even if there was a hint of any sort of wrongdoing, especially sexual harassment, we will not stand for it, there is zero tolerance. So what I'm saying is, you're not gonna change that person because if that person says, you know what, I could care less, that person could care less. But what you have to do is build those rules in place. But the people who fill those positions have to own it. The mayor has to own it. The city manager has to own it. The people who fill those positions as staff have to have continuous training and upgrading of their skills so they can come together and say, this is how it works. And then when you have that environment, you plunk a complaint into it and the complaint works. That person is not seen as a victim. They're not criticized for bringing forward their right to not be harassed. The person who is the harasser leaves unceremoniously because they know that all of the people around the council table say, no, that's not the way it works here. So there are a couple of things that need to be in place. The rules don't always work alone, but as long as people who are enforcing those rules believe in what they're doing, it works mighty well. Um, uh, I agree with, my, with uh, Zach there, very interesting presentation, so interesting that I can't decide which question to ask. Uh, but I want to uh, take you up on uh, your uh, account of the importance of the Integrity Commissioner reports, that they are in detail that you can understand because these are very important for the people that you're writing about, and they're very important for people who uh, are interested in municipal government generally. And I have read some of your reports, and you characterized your own work very well, I think. I mean, they're thorough. They're pretty long. But, yeah, but there are a lot of other ones that aren't very long. Yeah. Um, and they, they just jump over things, and you don't really know what's going on. Uh, as somebody who tries to follow these things, I find it hard to uh, uh, get a handle on what integrity commissioners are saying in general. Last time I looked, I couldn't find a place where all the integrity commissioners' reports were in the same place. I wonder if your organization of integrity commissioners has given any thought to uh, making all the integrity commissioners reports available all in one place so we can see, uh, A, what some of the issues are that are common to different places, and, uh, and uh, B, who's, who's writing proper reports and, uh, and who's not. Thank you for your question. So um, years ago, uh, a couple of us who, uh, Dave Jabucci, um, David Mullen, a couple of really, you know, much smarter than me people, uh, started this group that is now known as the Municipal Integrity Commissioners of Ontario. We decided we needed to meet twice a year to do exactly that. Let's, let's see how to write reports consistently. Because what we had in the early days is members of council saying, I don't like my integrity commissioner. So I'm going to ask the integrity commissioner over there, what do you think? Because I'm being investigated and my nutball integrity commissioner thinks that I'm actually, you know, uh, contravening the code. So we wanted to ensure that this regime that the province brought in was consistently applied by, by those who were appointed. So we started this organization. Fast forward to now, we've got about 40 members. Um, it's a loosely held organization. And uh, the city of Toronto's integrity commissioner, Val Jepson, who used to be at the provincial <coughs> integrity commissioner's office, uh, worked together with her staff to get our decisions on Canley. It's gonna be a slow process because each of the integrity commissioners is responsible for uploading through the process that has been set for us, 
our decisions, but we're hoping at some point we can get someone to facilitate it for us or uh, you know, work together to, 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 to have somebody who will work on this project for us. And you're absolutely right. Our decisions are now going to be on Canly, which is the, the legal website for uh, decisions, uh, legal decisions, so that all people can see these decisions. In terms of uh, best practices, how to write a good report, uh, how do you ensure procedural fairness in an investigation, uh, what are the steps? Part of that is going to be uh, facilitated by the, the codes of conduct under Bill 68 that says, uh, right now the reg is very thin, but it says, you know, your codes of conduct and your code protocol has to have at least these minimum standards. What we're trying to do is work with the Law Society of Upper Canada because, as you know, many of the integrity commissioners are lawyers or retired lawyers or retired judges, and we're trying to embed into that new area of, of expertise an understanding that there's a standard. There's a standard that has to be clear, it has to be detailed, it has to have a process ahead of time, you don't wing it while you're investigating. This is going to take some time. I'm going to do a pitch here. Uh, you, you can take it or not, but the same way you have to hold your elected officials to account, or they're going to do whatever they're going to do, you have to hold your accountability officers to account. Let's not be not let's not be unfair to people. Uh, I think that most of my colleagues, if not all of my colleagues, are professionals who are trying to do the right thing in, in very uh, difficult circumstances because. I was walked into a council uh, chamber by the police because nobody in that in that town wanted me there. Nobody wanted my report. Nobody wanted to hear what I had to say. And in order to do my job, I had to be escorted in by police and, and whisked to the border of the town at the end. So that's not fun. And a lot of us have to do that. But I think we have a responsibility when we see something to say at the committee of the whole meeting, I don't understand that. How did that work? Go to the city clerk and say, what is our process? Or what is your accountability officer's process for writing reports? And slowly make these types of questions known. We internally are working to ensure that our membership follows some common standards. We were hoping that would be embedded in the new legislation because many of us did go to the ledge and, and provide some input. Uh, there was no real uptake on that because I, I, I suspect they just want to allow us to be independent. And, um, but, but right now, uh, what we are doing is making sure decisions are on Canley for all to see. So do you have any idea when that'll be, that, that'll, when they'll be there? I think the first round are going to be there in the fall because we are uploading them now. But uh, I can say that if you, if, if you want to see some others, just go on their websites. Of the, of the municipality, or I know it's it's it shouldn't be this way, but uh, speaking with the clerk of the municipality, if they have uh, integrity commission reports, they can provide them to you. Yes. I know there, it, it should be facilitated in in one area, but I'm just saying, get on them. It is your right as as, as a citizen to have that information. But you get it on for your own municipality. That's not a problem. But when you're trying to keep track of what's going on in the province mm -hmm. generally, it's a, it's a problem, especially since some municipalities embed them so far down into the website that you can't find. So here's, and I agree. I'm sorry, I'm taking up too much time. No, I don't think so at all. I think, I think, you know, when we're talking about local government, there are issues, whether it is green space, whether it is development or intensification, whether it is bike lanes, we all feel very strongly about many things. <laughs> And if, if your homes are anything like mine, we sit around telling people what they should be doing. We're shouting at the TV and we're saying, I'm not looking at this anymore. One of the hardest things to do is to be engaged publicly. One of the hardest things to do is go to those meetings at seven o'clock at night, wait until you are called and make your deputation of five minutes. One of the hardest things is going to your elected official who keeps canceling meetings because they're busy and meeting with them and saying, here's my public engagement is the flip side of your elected officials. They can only do what you get them to do. And we will only do what more people say we need to do. Because I'm appointed by a jurisdiction. And if people are going to the city of Vaughan or to the Toronto District School Board or to the city of Barrie and saying, where are the integrity commissioner's reports? I thought they were supposed to be public. Then the newspapers get a hold of that and say, well, well, where are these integrity commission reports? 
you have to be vocal about what's not working locally, provincially, and federally. That's not an answer, but you know, it's a suggestion. Uh, so I have a question. Um, and this, we'll, we'll, we'll have more time with, with the class afterwards. Um, I'm just wondering how you reconcile your sort of dual role of, you know, being a source to provide advice to counselors, but also then investigating kind of the same people. Because um, I was at a conference a while back and a lawyer was talking and the advice he gave was that maybe municipalities should consider having two integrity commissioners, one for advice and one, one to do investigations. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on, on that. I agree with that. And I have encountered uh, issues where, you know, usually the people you investigate are the same people that you investigate. So, so here, here you go, a person coming to you saying, you know, I'd really like to know if I accept this ticket uh, to go to this fundraiser, would I be breaching the code? Well, you know what, you might be breaching the code. And then the person goes to the fundraising gala and then somebody files a complaint against them. What I do is I have a separate file and I turn my mind to this, this new set of facts. But I've always believed that there should be a separation between advice giving and investigation. And we have an example of that in the city of Calgary. Um, but we also have to look at the funds available. So whether you're looking at access and privacy, records management, security, or accountability officers, I could write a report and say to the municipality, I believe that for fairness, there should be an investigator and there should be an advice giver. And what I'm sure will happen is what's happening in one municipality that's really big and we're not going to really name it, they say, why do we need an integrity commissioner anyway? So at the end of the day, the most important um, disbursement of taxpayers' dollars is not to hire an investigator to ensure that elected officials are doing the right thing. That should not curtail me from putting forward a need to have fair processes but one of the reasons that more of us don't have that, that you know, two person, let me hire an investigator and I'm going to give advice is because we can barely get municipalities to have accountability officers. And this is why Bill 68 is such a welcome change because Bill 68 has said, we gave you 10 years municipalities and only 44 of you thought it was a good idea to have an integrity commissioner. Now all of you are going to have an integrity commissioner. So maybe with this new piece of, of legislation, there's some security that at least the office will be maintained. Maybe the person won't be. And so maybe this is an opportunity for us to start saying, here's some of the best practices you'd like to see for this office. Class reconvenes, but yeah, please join me again in welcoming or thanking Suzanne. Thank you.